<clears throat> um, thank you, Valerie. And I wanted to thank the organizers of the NCAR Explorer Series for um, allowing me to be here, and especially uh, Lorena Luna, who wasn't able to be here today but, but helped put this together. And all of you for coming out on the beautiful fall day to hear about a subject that's uh, very close to my heart. So to begin with, uh, you know, aside from ice sheets being interesting scientific phenomena in their own, in their own right, why, why do we here at NCAR care about them a lot? And the most obvious reason is because as ice sheets, as they lose mass, that mass goes into the ocean and raises sea level. And the more sea level, you, the higher sea level rises, uh, the greater the chances of flooding. Flooding is the most common and costly US natu uh, natural disaster. It causes about $10 billion a year of damage on average. Uh, some years when you have a big storm like Hurricane Harvey, significantly more than that. And the US population is increasingly concentrated in, social, in coastal counties with a lot of people and ecosystems and infrastructure uh, near coastlines. And uh, usually when you see pictures of flooding, it's associated with a major storm. Uh, sea level rise raises, of course, raises the baseline level and makes it likely that it, uh, a given storm will produce more damage because the storm surge starts at that higher baseline. Uh, but also increasing, increasingly we're seeing flood damage, which is more routine, which doesn't need a storm, but just happens during a, a high tide. So for example, this graph here is a time series going from 1950 to the present. And it shows the frequency of tidal <coughs> floods uh, above what's called a nuisance level, you know, en enough to cause problems uh, at various NOAA tide gauges along the coast. And you can see the frequency has increased a lot in the last 10 or 20 years, even with the relatively modest sea level rise that we've seen so far. And around the world, of course, there's many, many people exposed to, to uh, harm from sea level rise. About 300 million people, or close to 5% of the world's population, lives within five meters of sea level. And uh, the populations most at risk tend to be in Asia. Uh, if the climate were to warm two degrees Celsius over pre-industrial levels, um, we would expect to, see, uh, expect to see about five meters of sea level rise, ultimately. And there's people in China have the largest number at risk um, outside of Asia. The United States has about 12 million people living within five meters of, of sea level. And if, you're, if you happen to live in one of the small island nations um, in the Indian Ocean or the Pacific Ocean, sea level rise is already a real existential concern because many of these countries are on the, in the Pacific, for example, are in coral atolls. And the entire atoll may be no more than one or two meters above sea level. So this is, for example, is the most populated atoll in the Marshall Islands in the Pacific. And uh, it sits almost entirely within one or two meters of sea level. And along with several other countries, including Kiribati, Tonga, Tuvalu, uh, and others, uh, would no longer be habitable if sea level were to rise uh, even, even a couple of meters above the levels we have now. Uh, if you go back uh, to the late 1800s, which is when sea level measurements began, um, traditionally, sea level was measured by buoys and tide gauges, which were put in coastal locations. And the, <clears throat> the difficulty there is that um, sea level is rising at different rates in different places. And you have to somehow integrate that all over the world. But you, you, know, you do your best to combine these records. And you can compile a global sea level record going back to 1880. And you can see that sea level rise is, um, has been fairly study, steady over the last um, more than 100 years, with a total of about 20 centimeters of sea level rise uh, since 1880. And uh, here, I, I want to pause for a moment. Um, I'm a scientist, and I always think in terms of metric, because I find the other units to be too hard to keep track of. But, uh, but in case you're less familiar with metric, I'll just take a moment and, and do some conversions. Um, 30, 30 centimeters is about one foot. So if you see a number like three millimeters per year, you can convert that to 30, meters in a, I'm sorry, 30 centimeters in a century, or about one foot per century. Uh, I'll be using units of meters a lot. A meter is a little over three feet. Uh, a kilometer is about six tenths of a mile. And then when I talk about temperature, I'm going to talk about degrees Celsius. And you know, to, to get a sense of how big one degree Celsius is, it's important to remember that, uh, that one degree Celsius equals 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. So if I give a number in Celsius, you know, double it, take a little bit off the top, and, and that's what it would be in, in the degrees we're more used to thinking about. So since the, since the Industrial Revolution, temperatures uh, in the global average have risen by about 1 degree Celsius, or about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. But back to the sea level plot, uh, 
Since 1993, there have been satellites using altimetry, measuring the distance between the satellite and, and, and the sea surface, which we can use to get a global picture of what sea level is doing. And satellites show that sea level is now rising about three millimeters a year, which is larger than the 20th century, century average, uh, reflecting some acceleration that's happened um, in the last quarter century or so. Now, <clears throat> the global average sea level rise has two main causes. You can either add mass to the ocean, or you can increase the volume of a given mass of ocean. So if you melt ice on land, that's adding mass to the ocean. That can be either in the form of, of ice sheets or smaller glaciers. Uh, also, water expands um, as it heats. And since the, the ocean is heating, it's expanding and taking up more space. So to get, that's responsible for about one third of, of current sea level rise, with um, land ice melting accounting for about 2 thirds. Uh, but depending on where you are, the sea level rise rate can vary a lot. You can have, if, you, if your land is subsiding for natural reasons or because of pumping of groundwater or, or that sort of thing, uh, you can have that um, enhances the effects of sea level rise, makes your relative sea level rise more. Uh, you can also have, in some places, uh, slow land motions. For example, there are some places on Earth that are still rebounding from being covered with ice during the previous ice age. And that tends to make make it appear that sea level is falling. Uh, you can also have changes in, in ocean circulation. So for instance, the Gulf Stream has slowed down somewhat in the last few decades. And, the, and when the Gulf Stream slows down, that leads to more water piling up on the east coast of the US. So that's one reason that if you look at the numbers here, you can see the greatest uh, increases in uh, sea levels since 1950 um, on the east coast and the Gulf Coast with smaller increases on the left. So your, lo your local, local contributions can be at least so far as significant or, or larger than the global average contribution. And before I go farther, I wanted to talk about the different kinds of, of ice that, that I and my colleagues stu study. Uh, first, a glacier is just a mass of ice that's formed from snow. Snow that falls in the land, uh, doesn't melt in the summer, over the years compacts into ice under its own weight, and then um, uh, starts flowing downhill uh, under the force of gravity. And this is a, your prototypical mountain glacier in the French Alps called the Mer de Glace. Now, if you have a, uh, a glacier that um, thickens and expands to the point that it's no longer topographically constrained, for example, by mountains, but in this case, the Vatna Jokul ice cap of Iceland um, forms more of a dome shape. Uh, then uh, conventionally, if that's less than 50,000 kilometers squared, which is about the size of Switzerland, uh, it's called an ice cap. And if it's larger than that, um, it's called an ice sheet. So an ice sheet is, is a, a large mass of glacier ice, which is not constrained by mountains or other topography. So the Earth today has two large ice sheets, uh, one in Greenland and the larger ice sheet um, on filling most of the continent of Antarctica. And on an ice sheet, uh, the majority of the ice is typically grounded, meaning that if you dug down to the, the bed of the ice sheet, you would get to bedrock or soil. But uh, especially in Antarctica, a significant fraction of the ice sheet is floating. So what happens is the ice starts flowing out to sea. And at some point, it's sufficiently thin that it, uh, it floats. And no longer, once it floats, it no longer contributes to sea level directly were it to melt like an ice cube melting in a glass of water. Uh, but ice shelves can exert back pressure on the, the water that's on the glacier ice that's flowing into them. So if you remove an ice shelf and you remove that buttressing or pressure, um, ice shelves can contribute indirectly to sea level rise. So in Antarctica, the two biggest ice shelves are the Ross ice shelf here and the Ronnie ice, ice shelf, Ronnie Filchner ice shelf here. Um, those are both about the size of France, so you know, pretty good size. And the, the fastest flowing part of an ice sheet is called an ice stream. Uh, so for an ice sheet, fast would be anywhere between one or several kilometers per year. So not fast in a conventional sense, but, but that's a pretty fast speed for a glacier. And then the, the slower ice that would be on either side of the ice stream might be going somewhere between one and, and maybe a few hundred uh, meters per year. And uh, these are the so-called Seifel Coast Ice Streams, which flow into the Ross Ice Shelf. Oh, um, on this plot, here you can see the Greenland Ice Sheet. And here you can see the sea ice that Valerie mentioned, uh, which is very reflective and um, surrounded by um, ocean north of Siberia and Alaska in this particular photo. Um, every, 
Uh, the other kinds of ice, ice sheets and ice shelves and so on, are land ice. Sea ice is different in that instead of forming from, from compacted snow, it forms from seawater directly on the surface of the ocean. And so it doesn't affect sea level. And also the dimensions are a lot different. Sea ice is typically not more than, than two or three meters thick, whereas an ice sheet can easily be two or three kilometers thick. Uh, these are just the pictures, pictures of sea ice, first year ice on the Ross Sea in Antarctica. And this is a big multi-year ice flow surrounded by uh, first year ice, which is called pancake ice because it forms these characteristic disks. But that's all I'll say about sea ice for today. Uh, this is a picture taken by my, uh, one of my colleagues who was on doing field work in Greenland and took a picture out of, out of the airplane of the largest and fastest outlet glacier, which is similar to an ice stream, in Greenland, which is called Jakobshav in Isbre, which at its nearest terminus, it fills up a fjord called the Lulisat Fjord, which is only about five kilometers wide. But the ice, it goes uh, several tens of kilometers upstream. And it flows at the rate of 10 kilometers a year, which is, which is very fast. Uh, around it is the slower moving part of the ice sheet, which might be going oh, say, a couple hundred meters a year. And if you look over here, you can see you're away from the ice sheet. You are on land where there's, uh, the ice hasn't reached, but there's summer snowfall, I'm sorry, winter snowfall that then melts in the summer. And out here, this is the terminus of the ice sheet, where the ice, um, the, the main ice sheet ends and calves and forms icebergs. And then in the fjord, you can see this, what's called a melange of uh, icebergs and sea ice all mixed together. So that's just a picture to show lots of different kinds of ice all, all in one place. And I wanted to, to go back to the Mer de Glace in the French Alps, uh, partly because I, I happened to be there about a month ago. I, I was able to go to a workshop um, near Geneva and took a day to visit Chamonix, which is the, the town sitting below Mont Blanc, which has uh, several big glaciers fl uh, flowing off it down into the valley, including the Mer de Glace. This is the longest glacier in the French Alps. And it's been accessible by a cog railway since 1908. And before that, people would ride up to the glacier by mule. And so you can see, sometime in the early 20th century, people taking an expedition out on the surface of the Mer de Glace and all the, all the crevasses um, coming down from the, from, the, near the, from the summit of Mont Blanc. And there was a, a guy named Edward Spelterini, who in 1909 went up in a balloon so he could take this beautiful aerial photo of the Mer de Glace. And then there was another photographer who uh, uh, went up by helicopter just a year or so ago and took a picture from the same viewpoint. And you can see, for example, that the side walls here where there used to be ice, uh, there isn't anymore. So that gives you some sense of the retreat there's been in the last century. About 100 meters of thinning uh, compared, compared to where the surface used to be, which sounds like a lot. But when you're there, um, it's even more striking because you, you take the train up and then you get on a cable car, which takes you down to where the surface of the glacier used to be a few decades ago. And then, but instead of seeing a glacier there, you see steps, lots and lots of uh, kind of makeshift metal steps. And as you walk down, there are signs at various points along the way telling you that you've reached the level of the glacier at a certain year. So when you get to where the glacier was in 1990, which is not, not so long ago, uh, you look down, you've got a long way to go before you get to the terminus. And you walk a while longer, and you get to the 2005 level, and still quite a long way to go, quite a lot, of, at least a couple hundred steps. And then you keep walking, and then you get to 2015, and you think, oh, well, that wasn't long ago at all. Uh, but you've still got about 100 steps to go before you get to the, so, so, so the glacier is melting um, more, than, more than 10 meters a year at this point. And then you get to the bottom. And the, the, by the way, the reason, the reason most people do this is because there's an ice cape at the bottom, which is periodically carved out. Um, so you can go inside and see this beautiful blue glacier ice. So, so you do that. And they've also covered some of the ice with what looks like a big tarp to stop it from melting as quickly. And then you look back, you look back up, and you've got 430 steps to climb just to get to where the, the level of the ice was a few decades ago, um, which for me was uh, very striking and sad because uh, you know, this is one of the most iconic glaciers in the world, and it's given uh, pleasure to thousands and thousands of people, and it's been there for at least 10,000 years, and it's dying now. There will be no Mer de Glace as we know it in a few more decades because it just is not, can't be in balance with the climate that we're, that we're in today. Um, and <clears throat> if you look at how much ice it's lost 
in the last century. It turns out to be about a billion cubic meters. Or if a billion seems like a large number, you can imagine an ice cube that's one kilometer on each side. And that's about how much ice has been lost from the Mare de Glace in, in that time. And if you were able to weigh that much ice, it would be about a billion tons or, or one gigaton in the units that are used. And uh, it turns out that it takes a lot of, of ice to raise the sea level, even a small amount. So for example, if you to, to raise the sea level globally by one millimeter, you need about 360 gigatons of, of ice. So in other words, you would need to take all the ice that melted, uh, disappeared from Mare de, Mare de Glace in the last century, and put that in the ocean every day for a year, and that would give you one millimeter of sea level rise. And that happens to be about the contribution that ice sheets are making to sea level rise now. About one, one century's worth of glacier melt every day, you know, day after day, and increasing over time. So, so sort of going from the one glacier scale to larger scales, if you were to melt all the ice in the European Alps and add it to the, to the ocean, you'd get about 0 0.3 millimeters of sea level rise. So, you know, you know, not even a pencil point. If you were to melt all the ice in Alaska, which has considerably more ice, that would be about five, meters, five centimeters of sea level equivalent. So SLE means sea level equivalent, uh, which again is about 360 um, billion tons of ice. If you were to melt all the glaciers and ice caps in the world outside Greenland and Antarctica, you'd get just under half, of, half a meter of sea level rise. So while these are making a big contribution to sea level right now because they're relatively melting so quickly, uh, the contribution, uh, the ultimate contribution is not as great as that from ice sheets because there's just not as much ice there. Uh, the Greenland ice sheet is about, you know, it's a typically two or three kilometers thick and occupies most of the island of Greenland. And if you put all that in the ocean, that would raise sea level by about seven meters. But then about 90% of the ice is in Antarctica, about 60 meters sea level equivalent. So that's one reason people are most concerned about Greenland and Antarctica is just because there's so much ice there. Uh, then I want to say a little about the, the physics and dynamics of glaciers. As I said, a glacier forms from snow that compacts into ice and then starts flowing downhill. And you can think of ice, although it appears very solid, you can think of it as a very viscous, slowly deforming fluid. So if the ice were happened to be frozen at the bed, at the base of the ice, then it would gradually deform under its own weight with the velocity increasing as you go up. So the maximum velocity of a glacier is, is always at the surface. And this deformational component is typically not too big. It might be something like 100 meters a year of, of deformation, give or take. But if you want to gl get a glacier to, slow, to, to speed up, what you do is you add water at the bed. You could either do it in the form of a thin film of water that the glacier can slide on top of, or you, if you get water into this soil or till and that becomes soft, the, the soil can deform and that allows the glacier to move forward at speeds of a, a kilometer a year or, or, or more. And so the, the big ice streams are all, are all sliding in some way. And then uh, uh, glaciers, uh, when, the, when they're in balance with the climate, they have an equal amount of mass gain and mass loss in a typical year. So the, the mass gain is almost entirely from snowfall. So you have snow falling on the glacier and, and not, you know, <coughs> eventual, eventually turning into ice and some of it's blown around by the wind. Uh, but then you can lose, lose that mass either by sublimation from the surface, which is where it goes directly from the solid to the, the gas phase. Or uh, if it's warm enough in the summer, you'll have summer meltwater. And some of that will go back into the snowpack and refreeze, but some of it will, warm up, warm up, will run off to the ocean. So that's a way you can lose mass. And also, especially in Antarctica, you can, the ice can uh, thin as it reaches the ocean, but, but not melt at the surface. So you have a floating ice shelf here. And then what happens to a floating ice shelf is either you have some melt from the bottom if you have a warm ocean, or you can cab off an iceberg. And once you cab off an iceberg, it eventually melts somewhere else. So the, the, the mass balance in an ice sheet is between snowfall in and some combination of melting and sublimation and calving out. And it's the difference that gives you the, the change in sea level. So and a relatively, these are big numbers, and a relatively small imbalance can, can give you a, a big change in sea level. And uh, how do we know that ice, ice sheets are losing mass? Uh, we've only been able to measure the mass of ice sheets and ice mass changes uh, since about the 1990s. 
um, and that's because of uh, new satellites that were launched then. Uh, there's two um, main methods of measuring mass and mass changes in an ice sheet. One is uh, satellite altimetry, which is where you bounce a radar or, or light signal off the surface and measure the time to come back. And in that way, you can measure whether the surface is thinning or, or, or thickening. And so, for example, in Antarctica, you, this is called the Pine Island Glacier, um, that patch of red. And that's where the ice is significantly thinning, as measured by, by altimeter. Um, but one drawback of this method is that when the ice surface goes down, it could be because ice, the ice is losing mass, but it could also be because uh, the, ice, the snow is compacting, because it's more dense. And an altimeter doesn't distinguish between those two things. But if you uh, measure the, the ice sheet's gravity, which is what the GRACE satellites are designed to do, in this case, you have two satellites that are um, orbiting the Earth, one following the other. And it's possible to measure very small variations in distance between the two satellites, which tell you that the Earth's gravity field is changing in a certain location. And the changes in the Earth's gravitational field are associated with changing mass of ocean waters, or, or in this case, the mass of ice sitting below. So this is a map of ice loss from a Greenland ice sheet with the darker red colors showing where there's been the most thinning uh, between the time the GRACE satellite was launched in 2002 and uh, 2016. It was just ended its mission about a year ago, but there's another, another set of satellites that have been launched and are, are getting ready to go. Um, the thing about gravity is you don't get uh, the, the, the picture you get is a little bit at, smeared out and diffuse, but it is a measure of mass as opposed to just as opposed to thickness. Um, the Greenland ice sheet, as I said, is about seven meters sea level equivalent, and the mass that comes in is balanced in roughly equal, at least in a, when the climate's in, ba in balance, you have about equal amounts of surface melting leading to runoff and iceberg calving. Um, since the 1990s, though, Greenland's been out of balance and you've had mass loss of averaging about 280 gigatons a year. Uh, this is Greenland velocities, and you can see the, the blue colors are faster ice, and the red colors are slower ice. And you can see how you have all these fast ice streams along the west coast and southeast and then here in the northeast. And Greenland is relatively isolated from the ocean in the sense that most of its bed sits above sea level. Uh, this part here is below, where it's blue is below sea level because it's weighed down so much by the ice. But out on the margins, uh, most, most of the, the bed that the ice sheet sits on is above sea level. And that makes it relatively le less vulnerable to ocean warming than its counterpart, Antarctica. So Antarctica, as I said, has about 60 meters sea level equivalent. A lot of that ice is locked up in the cold, dry um, part of the ice sheet called East Antarctica, which is this part. And it's so, uh, so high up and so cold that a lot of that is uh, not vulnerable to any kind of melting we could, that would happen in the foreseeable future. Uh, however, this part of the ice sheet called West Antarctica, if you look at its topography, uh, all the blue spots are places where the ice sheet is grounded below sea level. So if you were to get, uh, in some case, you have an ice shelf, like the Ross Shelf here. In other case, you have grounded ice that's sitting on the seabed. So if you were to get warm water up under the, under the ice shelf, you have the potential to melt a lot of ice fairly quickly. And uh, paleoclimate or past climate records suggest that West Antarctica has ebbed and flowed a lot over the past couple of million years. And if you look, these are the, the, the fastest part of the Antarctic ice sheet is the two ice, big ice shelves here. And then here's Pine Island Glacier and Thwaites Glacier, which you might have read about, which are two of the fastest thinning and, and changing glaciers. And they're both uh, thinning, we think, because warm ocean water is getting up underneath them. Now if you go, so those are the two ice sheets we have now. If you go back in the past, there were, of course, more ice sheets. If you go back 20,000 years to a time called the last glacial maximum, you had large ice sheets over most of Canada coming down um, into what's now the northern United States, and also ice sheets covering a lot of northern Europe. And there was so much ice then that sea level was about 120 meters lower than it is now. And so there were places that are sea covered now uh, that where there were land bridges, for example, in the, the Bering Sea, where you, it was possible at times to walk between Asia and North America. Um, but in past warm climates, uh, sea, level, sea level has been a bit higher than it is now. Uh, the last warm, the, the present period is known as interglacial because we don't have big ice sheets. And the last interglacial before this one, called the last interglacial, was about 125,000 years ago. And compared to pre-industrial temperatures, 
uh, it was about one or two degrees warmer th than, th than those temperatures. So in other words, we're now about one degree warmer than we used to be, and that's getting to be at the low end of, of the last interglacial. Um, at that time, carbon dioxide was, was not that high compared to what, now it's about 400 parts per million, then it was about 280. Um, but we think that sea level over several thousand years increased by somewhere between six and nine meters. And we think, based on climate records and model simulations, this shows a simulation by one of my NCAR colleagues, um, Betty Otto Bliesner, that Greenland lost some ice, but only a couple of meters worth of sea level. So you had to have an Antarctic contribution of at least five meters, which would be uh, probably the majority of West Antarctica. And if you go back farther in time to the period that the, the waxing and waning of ice ages started about two and a half million years ago, now the period before that was called the Pliocene, which was two or three degrees warmer than the temperatures that were um, that have characterized the recent interglacial, and that was the last time carbon dioxide was as as concentrated in the atmosphere as it, as it is today, about 400 parts per million. And at that time, there's still some a lot of uncertainty because the records are not as plentiful. But we think global sea level was somewhere between 10 and 30 meters higher than today, with that temperature rise of two or three degrees. And uh, even to get 10 meters, you need probably most of Greenland, most of West Antarctica. And to get 30 meters, you, pro you certainly need some of East Antarctica as well. So this is concerning because we're, we potentially could have temperature increases at that size in the next several decades. Um, however, they would take a long time to play out. The changes that happened in the Pliocene um, happened over at least, at least several thousand years. Uh, but you can see that you don't, it may take a while, but you don't need a lot of warming to make sea, sea level go up uh, quite significantly. Uh, I want to spend a little time on this plot just to talk about some of the interactions between sea level and, and climate. Uh, this plot is based on records from an ice core that was drilled in Antarctica. And in an ice core, uh, you have bubbles that are trapped in the ice that preserve a record of the atmosphere that existed at the time the, that the snow fell and turned to ice. And so you can dig down to the bottom of Antarctic, the Antarctic ice sheet and in this case, find ice that's more than 400,000 years old. And you find that there have been, on roughly 100,000 year cycles, these changes in carbon dioxide concentration between about 200 and 300 parts per million, and global temperature changing very much in sync with the carbon dioxide, plus or minus about five degrees Celsius globally, and sea level going up or down by about 120 meters, depending on whether you have a big northern hemisphere ice sheet or not. And uh, these changes that have happened in the past have been associated with uh, changes in the Earth's orbit. Uh, the, the central idea being that uh, de depending on what the tilt of the Earth's axis is and what time of year the Earth is closest to the sun, you can have either cool or relatively warm summers in the northern hemisphere. And if you have a relatively cool summer, then the snow that falls during the winter may not melt during the summer and it has a chance to pile up and, and form an ice sheet. And we think that's what happened about at the end of the last interglacial, about 120,000 years ago. And then the ice sheet slowly built up over the next 100,000 years to the last glacier, glacier maximum. And then the orbital configuration lined up such that you had a high amount of melting in the northern hemisphere. And the ice sheet at that time may have somewhat overextended itself and been relatively unstable. And then you can melt a very large ice sheet um, in a fairly short time, getting up to several meters of sea level rise per century until 10,000 years ago when the big ice, sheet, big ice sheets um, in Canada were mostly gone. And then we've had a period of about 10,000 years called the Holocene uh, leading up to the Industrial Revolution when we had a climate that was fairly stable and, and benign. Um, this, I should say, is actually not, to, not quite to scale. Um, if it were to scale, the 400 would be something like this. And it's not possible to increase CO2 without having an effect on temperature. Um, the, the relationships are somewhat complicated, and CO2 and temperatures tend to feed back on each other. Um, and that's what's, that, that's what's different about the present time, is that we're way out of, the, out of bounds of the natural changes in CO2, and CO2 is fundamentally what's driving everything else. If you go back <coughs> about 3,000 years and look at sea level reconstructions, uh, this, this is about uh, 500, <coughs> 500 BC up to the present. You can see that there are some wobbles, but generally sea level was only varied by about five centimeters or so per century, as compared to about 15 centimeters in the 20th century. So the rise we've seen um, 
in the last century was the largest in, we think, at least 3,000 years, and probably during the whole Holocene. Uh, if you look just during the satellite era, since 1993, uh, this is a figure compared to, uh, prepared by one of my colleagues at the university here in Boulder. Uh, this is global average sea level rise from satellites. And you can see some wobbles from year to year that are associated with things like volcanoes and whether there's an El Nino that changes the, the temperature of the Pacific. But overall, a steady increase with a little bit of acceleration in recent years, which is probably associated with a greater contribution from ice sheets than there was earlier. And the, the average here is about, as I've said, is about three millimeters per year. And of that three millimeters, you get about equal contributions from uh, the Greenland Arctic ice sheets, from glaciers and ice caps, and from thermal expansion of the ocean as it warms. And you can see the increasing contribution from Greenland Antarctica, and that Greenland has a relatively greater contribution, although Antarctica has been apparently catching up in the last several years. Then if you look forward into the 21st century, uh, the, you've likely heard of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, which every six or seven years puts out a massive report on the state of the science of climate change and climate change adaptation and mitigation. And their last report was in 2013. And they typically consider a range of emission scenarios ranging from low greenhouse gas emissions, if CO2 emissions were to sort of peak now and fall rapidly through the rest of the century, and high emissions, which is more of a, a business as usual scenario. And between the low and high emissions, you can see that by 2100, it makes a big difference to your temperature increase, where with high emissions, you have a projected global average temperature increase of around three or four or five degrees Celsius. Um, whereas with, with the low, you, you can top out around one or maybe one and a half. Um, similarly with sea level, which is highly correlated to temperature, uh, up through about 2050, the spread is relatively small. That even with the low emissions, we're probably committed to another uh, 30 to 60 centimeters, one or two feet of sea level rise um, by 2100, even with these, with low emissions. Uh, but with higher emissions, we're looking at probably a range of half a meter to a meter with the separation coming in the, in the later part of this century. Uh, but there was a sort of asterisk associated with this projection, which was that when the report came out, uh, there, was, there were suggestions that the marine-based sectors, the part of Ant the Antarctic ice sheet grounded below sea level, um, might be unstable to collapse. And if so, sea level could go up more than, than the likely range of half a meter to a meter uh, during the century. And I want to come back to that, but first just to add that, again, global average sea level rise is not necessarily the same as what you see locally. Uh, I mentioned subsidence and um, glacial rebound, but also ice sheets are massive enough to have their own gravity. So if an ice sheet loses mass, it no longer tugs as hard on the ocean that's, that's ar immediately around it. And so you could actually have potentially sea level fall around the melting ice sheet while, you ha while sea level rises everywhere else. So if you're in North America, other things being equal, you would prefer to lose mass from Greenland if you had to rather than Antarctica. Um, but, but, but these are, these are um, this is the relative contribution. This is still imposed on a, a overall sea level rise in, in most of the world. Uh, the Greenland ice sheet, we think, is, would not be viable if you had warming of more than a couple of degrees Celsius. Um, you already have a lot of summer melting in Greenland. And if you had more summer melting, what eventually would happen is that you'd have, even if you uh, took iceberg calving out of the picture, you would have more summer melting and runoff than you have incoming snowfall. And at that point, what's called the surface mass balance, which is the difference between the incoming snowfall and the mass loss, would be negative. And loss of the ice sheet would be inevitable if nothing were done about that. But it would take a long time, at least several hundred years and maybe, maybe two or 3,000 years. Now, this is a climate simulation showing the evolution of Greenland over several thousand years. And it um, starts off slow, but what eventually happens is that as you thin the ice sheet, um, the ice sheet is now, because it's lower in elevation, it feels a warmer atmosphere. And the warmer the atmosphere it feels, the more it's melting. And so that can be a positive feedback that, that leads to more rapid um, decline. And once that gets going, it may, may not be possible to, to reverse. In Antarctica, um, there's not much summer surface melting at this time. But there's a lot more exposure to the ocean, which makes things more complicated. Uh, if you look at the, um, the ocean off the coast of Antarctica, the typical structure you see is you, see you have fresh and cold water sitting on top of warmer and saltier water. Typically, the warm water is, the is at the top because warm water is lighter. But because, the, in this case, the 
warm water is salty. It actually sits below the colder water. And warm for an ice sheet means maybe one or two degrees above freezing, which is still pretty cold. But for an ice sheet, that's enough to melt maybe 10 or 20 meters of ice in a year. So you have, in many places, you have this warm water, relatively warm water, called circumpolar deep water, sitting just off the continental shelf. And if that water is able to get um, onto the continental shelf and under the ice shelf, you can do a lot of melting in a fairly short time. And then um, this is called the grounding line. That's where the ice is thin enough to become a float. And the way the, the bed is drawn is that it gets deeper as you go inland. And because of the dynamics of ice sheets, uh, if you start melting and making the grounding line go back to here, um, the thicker ice is, the faster it flows. So you have this big arrow showing and representing increased flux from a thicker ice sheet. And if you have an increased outflow of ice, that means you get more thinning, and so on. So it, once this gets going, you can have retreat all the way back until the bed reverses slope and starts turning up again. Um, and this is potentially something that, can, that, once triggered, can go on without needing any more warm water to trigger it. It's just going to happen on its own. Um, another thing of concern in Antarctica is although most of Antarctica is the ice sheet is very high and cold, um, the ice shelves themselves are close to sea level, and some of them have been warming in recent years. And this one in particular is called the Larsen B, uh, which was an ice shelf on the Antarctic Peninsula. And uh, in 2002, uh, because of surface warming, you had a lot, lot of ponding on the surface of the shelf, which you can see by the dark coloring here. And what we think happened is that the ponds led to crevasses that went all the way through the shelf. And then the shelf um, shattered over the course of a few weeks in 2002. Um, so there's no, there's no shelf there now. And the glaciers that were being buttressed by the shelf sped up. And this was measured. And this is not one of the largest ice shelves. But if this were to happen to a larger ice shelf, as has been speculated, um, that could lead to a big increase in, in flow of grounded ice into the ocean. And that was the hypothesis of a, a paper that came out a couple of years ago, which is probably the most talked about paper on ice sheet modeling. Um, in the last few years uh, by Rob DeCanto and David Pollard. And they have an ice sheet model and were, um, had found that their ice sheet model wasn't as sensitive as they thought it should be to the war warming associated with past climates like the last interglacial. And they put in these new mechanisms, uh, one called hydrofracture, which is what I just described with the melting ice shelf, and another thing called marine ice cliff instability, which is like the ice sheet instability but has to do with ice that ends abruptly abruptly with, with the shelf not there anymore. And they, in, that, in their model, they found really large rates of sea level rise, um, close to a meter from Antarctica alone in the next century, and as many as 12 meters by 2,500, with a big collapse in, of West Antarctica and some retreat of East Antarctica. But uh, there's a lot of speculative things in this model. And some people maybe have taken the model more at face value than, than is appropriate at this point, because the model is relatively, for example, has relatively coarse resolution. And it has treatments of physical pro processes that are not, are not very certain. Um, so at this point, this is still very speculative. But, but people, like, you know, people like me and others who, who model ice sheets, uh, what we really want to do is model these processes more realistically and get a sense of whether this sort of scenario is, is plausible. So that brings me to the climate model I work on, which is and with many other people at NCAR and at universities around the US and the world, called the Community Earth System Model, or CESM. Uh, CESM has been around in some form for more than 20 years. Uh, its predecessor was called the Community Climate System Model. And traditionally, in a climate model, you have components for the land surface, the atmosphere, sea ice, and the ocean, which are connected by a, a, what's called a coupler that exchanges uh, fluxes in various fields between the components. And up until about 2010, uh, ice sheets, at least, w were not considered as dynamic, not moving objects in a climate model. So Greenland, for example, was treated in the predecessor of CESM as just a big, bright rock reflecting a lot of radiation. But then there were these observations in the 90s and 2000s showing that ice sheets actually can change on time scales of a few decades that climate models are supposed to be concerned with. And so uh, there was a demand for a new generation of models, which are often called Earth system models, uh, which are like climate models, but typically include some other things that aren't tradi weren't traditionally included in climate models, among those being ice sheets, but also many other processes having to do with um, biology and, and chemistry. And so 
in 2010, we had the first version of CESM, and we had a simple ice sheet model in, in that that I worked on. And then just this past summer, we had the release of CESM2 uh, with a much more uh, realistic ice sheet model that, that, uh, that I and others have spent several years working on. And another thing we introduced is interactive coupling between ice sheets and the land and atmosphere. And what that means in this case is that uh, let's, <coughs> the land model uh, computes what happens to snow and how much snow melts and forms. And so the land model is what tells the ice sheet model how much it's thinning or thickening at the surface. And then the ice sheet dynamics model will respond and either thicken or thin. Uh, and with the, interac with the interactive capability, now the ice sheet model tells the land model, OK, your surface is now lower than it was because I've thinned. So then the land model can incorporate the feedback that comes from having a thinner ice sheet with the warmer atmosphere. Uh, so that's a, a more realistic kind of coupling than, than we used to have. Um, however, it's very hard, uh, both scientifically and, and technically, to couple ice sheets to the ocean. And that's something that we um, have not implemented yet, but something we're working on and hope to have in um, maybe CESM3. So there are parts of the simulation that look, look pretty good for ice sheets. Uh, this panel shows Greenland surface mass balance, the difference between accumulation and melting. And the red areas are areas of net melting, and the blue areas are areas of net accumulation. And the left-hand panel is from a regional model called RACMO, which is run at very high resolution and is very well um, validated or, or checked against observations. And it's the closest thing we have to the, the true surface mass balance of Greenland. Uh, this is, uh, in the center, is what CESM2 does, the model you can check out off the web. And you can see that for the most part, Greenland's pretty good. We capture these ablation zones, and we have maximum snowfall here in the southeast. But the snow in the south is too diffuse, and we have too much snow getting into the, the central south part of Greenland. And that's probably mostly because we don't, the model's too coarse to represent the mountains here. And so we have too much uh, snow leaking into the interior. Uh, so that's a, called a model bias that we're always working to reduce that sort of bias. And then one of my colleagues recently sent me this plot, which shows a, a new uh, developmental version of CESM2 with a feature called variable resolution, which means you can take the atmosphere model and give it finer resolution. The grid cells are smaller over a particular place you're interested in, in this case, Greenland. And in that case, you can resolve these mountains better, and you find that there's not nearly as much leakage in the center. So we're hoping that in a future version of CESM, this will be a regular operational thing, and that'll improve our Greenland simulation. In Antarctica, uh, we have, for a global model, which is relatively coarse resolution of you know, grid cells, about 50 or 100 kilometers on a side, uh, a very good snowfall simulation, although sort of similar to Greenland, uh, the red areas are areas of high snowfall. And if you compare to the RACMO version uh, to CESM, you can see there's a little bit too much snowfall leaking in from the coast instead of being concentrated very close to the coast. But overall, the, the structures look pretty good. And in particular, that we have pretty good snowfall and temperatures here in the ice shelves. So we think that if, if we project a, a warming that leads to melting on the surface of the ice shelves, that the climate model may be able to depict that process fairly realistically. Um, on the ice sheet dynamics side, we have something called the community ice sheet model, or SISM, which represents ice sheet flow. And these are some uh, SISM simulations I've been working on for Greenland, where the left-hand panel shows velocity observations, specifically the surface velocity that you can measure from aircraft or satellites. And then on the right-hand side shows the model velocity. And here are the <coughs> various ice streams and outlet glaciers on the west coast, which are resolved very well by the model. And the slow flowing ice in the, in the center is well modeled. Uh, one thing we're missing, though, is there's this feature called the Northeast Greenland Ice Stream. And that's much too weak in the model. And we think that's because we don't have a good representation of the, the basal water, the basal hydrology. And that, so we don't have enough water here. Um, so one thing we'd like to do is have a better basal water model and capture this particular feature. Uh, over in Antarctica, um, that's harder than Greenland. And one reason it's harder is because the, um, the shape of Antarctica, and in particular, in particular how thick and extensive these ice shelves are, uh, is very sensitive to how much melt you have coming from the ocean underneath the shelf. And we don't yet have models that give us accurate pictures of what the melt is going to be underneath an individual ice shelf. So 
Observations on the left, the areas that are red are the big ice shelves that are flowing fast. And then the red and yellow regions um, upstream are the ice streams flowing into the big ice shelves. And here is uh, results from a recent model simulation. And you can see the model in this case is capturing the observed flow really nicely. So, you know, all these individual ice streams, for example, uh, they depend on the topography. So if you have a, rep a good representation of the topography, you can capture a lot of the structure in a model. Uh, but uh, this particular simulation depends on adjusting the melt rates to, to give you shelf, ice shelf extents that are similar to what's observed. If we didn't have those melt rates, uh, we would get a simulation that, that didn't look as, as good. So uh, a big future goal for Antarctica would be to have models that can give you these more realistic basal melt rates so we can kind of predict, predict the whole system without having to um, adjust, adjust things along the way. And one of the big things that, that people will be working on who are interested in ice sheets um, at NCAR and many other labs and universities over the next couple of years is a project called ISMIP-6, which stands for the Ice Sheet Model Inter Comparison Project for CMIP-6. And CMIP-6 is the sixth go-round of the Climate Model Inter Comparison Project, which is a big international exercise to compare all sorts of climate models in all different ways. There's maybe 20 or so global climate models they get together every few years to compare their results and try to figure out why results are similar or different. And this is the first time that ice sheets have been part of that process. And so there are, there are three main parts of ISMIP-6. Uh, the first thing we want to do is take a standard global model, CESM, that doesn't necessarily have, have um, dynamic ice sheets in it, but just look at all the model results that are relevant for ice sheets, like how much snowfall and melting there is in, in Greenland or Antarctica. And then in addition to that, we want to take the output from these various climate models and use that to give us our best estimate of how much additional melting there's going to be over the next century or so, uh, both on the surface and um, uh, beneath ice shelves and ice sheets. And so the idea would be you get your best possible view of the, the snowfall and melting, and then you apply that to something called a standalone ice sheet model, which is just an ice sheet model that's not connected to a climate model, but is responding to the forcing that comes from a climate model. And then finally, we're going to do a round of what we call coupled ice sheet climate experiments, where you can have that interactive coupling I was talking about earlier, where the climate changes the ice sheets, the ice sheets change the climate in return, and the two can, can feed back on each other, and we can look at how much they feed back. And so we will use CESM on its own for this, and CISM, our ice sheet model, for this, and then the two in combination for this. So uh, our group and our collaborators will be involved in all aspects of, of this project. And that's about all I want to say on the, on the technical side of things. Uh, I wanted to finish up by uh, presenting a few broader, broader questions. And my best attempt to answer those questions, given what we know, but also given the, the various uncertainties. So something, if you're a, a coastal planner and say you're, you want to build infrastructure that will endure for the next 50 or 75 years, uh, you want to know how much sea level to plan for. And you may be very risk averse. And so you may particularly be interested in what's the, what's, the, what's the worst thing that could happen? What's the most sea level rise we could see? And uh, that's what the IPCC reports always try to do, is give a best estimate and an upper bound. Uh, but in the case of sea level, um, if Antarctica doesn't do anything um, abrupt and catastrophic, we think that sea level rise by 2100 is probably not much greater than, greater than a meter, and maybe, maybe a bit less, which is certainly significant. Um, and certainly something that planners need to take into account and could displace people. Um, but the issue there is that it could be worse, and it's hard at this point to quantify what the probab probability is that it could be worse than that. So that's something that we're, we'd very much like to have a better handle on. Uh, another question is just, uh, can we get reliable sea level predictions from climate models and Earth system models? You know, For several decades, we've been using climate models to predict changes in temperature and precipitation. Uh, but we haven't typically, you haven't typically been able to take look at climate model results and say, okay, this is how much my local sea level is going to go up. And that's something we're moving toward. And I think in terms of predicting changes in snowfall and melting, the climate models are now, now pretty good. Uh, but as I've said, the models are not yet good at modeling interactions between ice sheets and oceans. So that's a part that uh, we want to improve on. And, but hopefully by the next generation of climate models, we'll be able to do better with that. And then what everyone wants to know is what's going to happen in Greenland and Antarctica in the long run. And 
uh, based on uh, what we know from models and recent events, but also from records of past climates, like the last interglacial. We think that with global average warming of around one and a half to two degrees Celsius, and at this point it's hard to see how we could have warming of less than that relative to pre-industrial times, uh, the long-term sea level rise is likely to be around five meters, uh, which is a lot. However, um, with temperatures of one and a half or two degrees Celsius, that sea level rise is likely to occur pretty slowly. So it wouldn't happen all at once. And you would have, let's say, several centuries over which this, these changes start to happen, that with new technologies or different policies, you might be able to curtail the temperature increase that would stop the sea level from rising that much um, uh, you know, before, before it's, you get the irreversible changes. However, if you have warming of, let's say, three degrees Celsius, you know, a little over five Fahrenheit or more, um, it seems from past climates that the Greenland ice sheet is probably not viable, that most of it would melt. And the West, Antarct West Antarctic ice sheet would probably collapse at some point. And um, maybe you'd lose significant parts of East Antarctica as well. And so you'd get sea level rise in the long run of at least 12 meters and maybe more like 20. And that would be pretty well catastrophic if it were to occur on, on human time scales. Um, again, these changes will take place relatively slowly. But the higher the temperature, the faster they happen. And the more likely you are to reach a point where, at some point, the changes are, for practical purposes, irreversible and will just unfold inexorably over the next, next several centuries. And so <clears throat> I think for, for planning purposes, you'd like to know where the thresholds are that um, still give you time to reverse if, as you learn, as you get new information. Uh, and the temperatures I've mentioned are quite relevant to the Paris Climate Agreement, which you've likely heard about. Uh, this was signed uh, and at the end of, in Paris, at the end of 2015. Uh, this map came out about a year ago, and it shows all the countries that ratified and or signed. And um, two countries at the time, Syria and Nicaragua, that had not signed, and one country, this one, that had signaled its intention to leave the Paris Climate Agreement. And uh, since then, Syria and Nicaragua have signed. So it's <laughs> just, just this one now. And <laughs> Uh, How's that going? Well, uh, interesting that the way that the way the agreement was written is that you can't withdraw instantly. Once you give your intent, you have to wait three years, and then there's another year. And so it turns out that the earliest date the U.S. can effectively withdraw is November 4th, 2020. <laughs> and uh, it just happens that there's an election on November 3rd, 2020. <laughs> and so, so we may not have seen the last of this yet. You know, we'll see what happens. Uh, but but in, in, ter in the terms of the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, in some ways, this was unprecedented because just about every country in the world made a commitment to um, stop global climate change at a level that would not cause catastrophic harm. And so the, the agreement is to limit global warming, uh, quote, well below 2 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels, and also pursue efforts to keep that increase to 1.5. And it was kind of surprised that the Paris Agreement came up with 1.5, because that was considered by many people to be too ambitious. But a lot of the small island states and other countries that were existentially threatened by um, uh, sea level rise said, no, two degrees would be the end of our, our country. It needs to be less than that. So that was taken as, a, as a, at least a goal. However, the co commitments co countries have actually made are likely to allow warming of at least three degrees Celsius. So if we were to avoid some of the catastro more catastrophic impacts with regard to ice sheets, but also other parts of the climate system, um, three degrees is probably not enough to prevent some things from happening that would make the planet look quite different than it, than it does today. So, um, but I don't want to leave on a hopeless note because <laughs> 1.5 or two um, I, th I, think there could be, I think there's a big difference between 1.5 or 2, uh, at least for ice sheets, versus 3. And I think it's significant that this, many, that this many countries have made that a commitment. And then the question is, is how quickly countries will, um, how aggressively countries will, will pursue keeping those commitments. So um, to summarize, 
Um, sea levels, it's a very interesting time to be a scientist studying ice sheets and sea level because there's, we're learning a lot, but there's still a lot of uncertainty, especially with regard to Antarctica. And to work on Earth system models, it's an exciting time because the models are getting better at simulating all these things. But as I've said, the uh, simulating interactions between ice sheets and oceans is still um, in its early stages. And finally, um, what, human, what humans do in the next several decades will be very, very consequential for ice sheets. So I would say the long-term fate of ice sheets has not been determined, and that what we do, what people do, um, in the next 20, 30 years will have a lot to say about what happens in the, in the long term. And uh, thank you very much for listening.